Hey everybody, it's Kelly. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Therapist. We're continuing our series on religious trauma, and in this video, we are going to talk about six things that you can do to begin healing from that trauma. Let me throw this caveat out there. If you're new, this is not what my voice normally sounds like, but I've been sick for three weeks, and I'm afraid if I don't film and get this out next week, the algorithm's really going to punish me. I've got my tea, I've got my water, and we are going to go. If you're not new to the channel, you know religious trauma is something we talk about a lot. And it seems to me like it's not talked about a lot outside of, I don't know, certain venues like this one. But much of that reason is because religious trauma is so deep-seated in people's lives that sometimes they don't know it's happening, they don't know it's there. They're not aware of the way that religion has impacted them, and therefore it's next to impossible for them to help other people walk through it. The thing that keeps getting said to me about religious trauma is what is it, which we've dealt with a couple of different times, and two weeks ago I did an entire video about what is religious trauma, and also, now that I know about it, what do I do? The number one thing that you need to do, the first thing you have to do in order to recover from religious trauma is admit that it's there. One of the issues with religious trauma is that the trust that you have to put into elders, pastors, parents, teachers, all of that trust that you put into those people to lead you, when you discover that you're being traumatized by the things that they are saying to you or expecting from you, that leads to a great deal of distrust of yourself and of them. That can be detrimental to some people's psyche. So there are people who absolutely do not want to admit that religious trauma plays a part in their lives at all. But the thing about that is, if you don't admit it, if you don't verbalize it and call it out for what it is, how do you expect to heal from it if you won't address it? There's this idea that if we walk away from the religion, that we're fine. But you walk away with scars, and you walk away with scars that other people gave you that they didn't have a right to give you. I mean, no one has a right to give you scars, right? But in these situations, the scars that you're walking away with are egregious. And you watch these people stay in the thing that traumatized you and upset you and hurt you, and then ostracizing you because you've chosen not to play their game anymore. So you need to admit it, you need to own it, you need to call it out. And when I say own it, I don't mean own your part in it, I mean you need to own that this is something that has happened to you and that you no longer want that to affect you in the way it has affected you so far. Number two, and it's super important, this is your second step, get connected somewhere with supportive people. Maybe that's a group of people who've also gone through religious trauma. Maybe it's, I don't know, subscribing to a YouTube channel that talks about religious trauma. Who knows? Get around people who are going to support you, who are going to affirm you in your decision to leave, who are going to affirm the things that happened to you, and to tell you it's not okay that those things happened to you. You're going to need them for step three. Step three is creating healthy boundaries. Good fences make good neighbors, right? If you heard that said before? The point of that statement is that fences show you where the lines are. Boundaries show you where the lines are in your life and how far someone gets to speak into it and how much much influence they get to have on your life itself. You need to set up those boundaries again because the amount of influence that religious leaders or your parents or even your peers have had on you in order for you to stay in an abusive religion for that long probably means that you don't have great boundaries anymore because they've been breached so often. At some point, even if you had good boundaries in the beginning, when they're breached so often and so nonchalantly, when people are asking you personal questions that they have no right asking, when people are expecting things from you that no one else in your life is expecting as far as loyalty and focus, when those things are happening all of the time and so run-of-the-mill, whatever, haha, this is how we do it, it's going to make you think your boundaries previously are not that good. So getting healthy boundaries with this new group of support people or even with your old support people who are staying in your life, if there's any of them, creating those boundaries are super important and you need to do it from the beginning. Steps one, two, and three are setting you up for four, which is a super crazy important step. It's one that I can see people having trouble with. Step four is separating your personal beliefs from your religious beliefs and then exploring what you believe and why. One of the things about religious trauma that in healing from it really trips people up the most is how do I know what I believe and how do I know what I was just told to believe? And that might be a question you ask yourself for a while. But in this step, you have to ask yourself that question. One of the ways to start to separate your beliefs from your religious beliefs is to find other people who are good, who are caring, who are helping others. Whatever it is that was like what drew you into that religious community or what kept you in that religious community, find people outside of a faith 
that are also doing that. And that's super important because especially in evangelical Christianity, we're pretty famous for acting like all good virtues in someone's life comes from the fact that they're Christians. But if that was the case, then only Christians would be doing good things to people and only Christians would be helping others. And 2022, I'm going to say the Christians are the minority of people that are helping others selflessly anyway. In the exploring of what you believe and why, lists are super helpful. Make a list of what you know to be the religious tenets from the religion that you're leaving. And then make another list of things that are important to you. There can definitely be some overlap. If a priority to you is helping other people in need, and that's a huge central tenet of the religion you're leaving, it's okay for that to be overlapping, right? It's okay for you to believe some of those things. It doesn't mean you're falling into that toxic place again. It just means that in their guesswork, they got a couple things right. Then I'd make a third list about things you're not sure about. If a central belief to the religion that you're leaving is that there's an afterlife, and you also believe there's an afterlife, but you're not sure what you believe because you've been so programmed to believe certain things that your religion believes, that goes in the third list. The areas that you need to explore and think a little more and get some space from in order to figure out what you believe. It's okay to not know what you believe about everything right away. In what world do we ever always know what we believe about everything? That's not real life. As we learn new things in life, our beliefs change. And if they don't change, at least a little bit, are we learning and growing? Step five, I want you to identify what you're hopeful about. I want you to be super specific, especially if you've come out of evangelical Christianity. One of the things that said ad nauseum to people is that as Christians, we have hope in the future and we have hope in what's to come and we have hope in a bigger purpose. And those who are lost. That's what evangelical Christians call people who aren't Christians is lost. Have no hope. And so we have to bring Jesus to them so that they have hope. That's ugly. <laughs> That's ugly. To assume that people who are not Christians don't have hope is a very bleak outlook on the world. It's so narrow to believe that other people don't see the beauty in the world. It's so narrow to believe that other people are not aware that humans are capable of amazing things, of atrocious things also, but also amazing things beautiful things that helps us continue to have hope in people when then we also have, I don't know, politicians walking around in bright white boots, making everybody feel smaller than they are so that they feel important. The redemptive quality of the human experience, even that word redemptive has been co-opted by churches. When I say redemptive, I mean we see ugly in people every day. And then you see something beautiful or something connective. The human condition is for connection and to be in relationship with other people. That's how we know to relate to people. That's what we crave as humans. Which is, by the way, one of the things that religions prey on the most is our need to connect to others because then they can threaten your connection to others by saying, if you don't follow our rules, you can't play in our sandbox anymore, so you better get in line. Identifying something that you are hopeful for in the future that's not grounded in this idea of behaving correctly or earning love and acceptance that just is about the future, that is something you get to hold on to then when you get sad about the things that you've had to lose, when you get frustrated about the way that people are treating you now or about how much work it takes to undo the things that many someones inflicted on you without your consent. The number six, I'm actually tying two together. Part of it is get a therapist. And I, look, I am a therapist. And so I obviously think that everyone needs therapy. But in reality, having a therapist that can walk you through these pieces and help you to understand what it is you actually believe and what it is someone has told you to believe is really helpful because some of this work is a little too emotional for people to be able to do themselves. And the last part of that is know that you're not alone. You're not. I hope that you're reading through some of these comments on the purity culture and religious trauma videos on this channel and understanding that your experience, while unique and just yours, has similarities. You are not alone. You don't have to feel alone in this. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for hanging in with me. Hopefully next time my voice will be all better. Either way, I will see you all next week. And until then, take care of yourselves and each other.